Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Amen. I got to make sure that I'm not here alone. Amen. Otherwise, this thing can take all day. I mean, we have until tomorrow, right? <laughs> well, I want to thank uh, those who have joined us online. I want to thank those that are part of the Segovia unit, also Lopez unit, and the West Lago boot camp that will be watching this service at a later time. I want to thank you for joining us, our, those of you who are also with us online. And those of you who are in the house, amen, amen. There's nothing like being in the house, amen, nothing like it. Yeah, you can watch from online, but there is just something about being here that does something different in you. Amen? Amen. I tell you, I love it when I get together with the people of God because it just stirs my spirit to be here with you and what God is wanting to do. Amen? I love what Amanda said earlier. She said, sometimes all you, all you uh, just want to say is just, oh. I know there are times when I want to pray out to God, and sometimes all I can get out is an oh. And sometimes that is an oh me. Oh my, Lord, help me. Because sometimes I just cannot get the words together what I want to say. But I know that in my spirit, as I'm just reaching out to him and just saying, oh, that his presence come there because I'm his child. Amen. Yeah. Somebody got somebody a witness with me? Because yeah. sometimes all you can say is oh. And sometimes it's just, oh, me. But the Lord hears that, and he puts the rest of the words to it. Amen? Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. You know, uh, all of us have keys, right? We all have keys. And there's a key on this key ring that I put into the ignition of a car. And every time I drive up and you see me in that car and you wave at me, and there's no doubt in your mind as far as who you think the owner of that car is. And you say, oh, there's Pastor Carl. There he is driving that 2005 uh, vehicle. <laughs> and you say, yes, go for it. But when I put the key in, it turns the ignition, and I'm able to get from one spot to the next spot. It takes me to the destination that I need to get to. And so there's no doubt when you see this key and you hear that car go, you know that must be his. And it's not until if I'm driving along and all of a sudden that officer comes to the window and he knocks on it. What does he ask for? License, registration, insurance. proof of insurance. Some of you have been pulled over before. Because <laughs> you just do that just like this. And so... When he looks at the registration, whose name is he looking for? The owner. And if he says, after looking at the registration of the car that I'm driving, if he says, Mr. Farmer, do you have permission to operate this vehicle from the owner? What would you assume? I don't own the car. Absolutely. And so, when he's ask me that question, the expectation is that I would say, yes, I own the car. I didn't steal it. The car belongs to my son. And when you look at that registration, there's something on that registration called a VIN number, vehicle identification number. And that officer when he looks at the registration and he sees that vehicle identific identification number or that VIN number, he knows that the paper is correct. The documents are correct. And the owner of the car is according to the person. When he looks at the license and looks at the registration and looks at the VIN number, he knows that everything is correct according to the law and according to his expectations. And just as he would ask me, do you have the permission of the owner to drive this car? And my answer had better be yes. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. I'm due for a little ride downtown. <laughs> and so that is the case with each and every one of us. That sometimes we don't understand. Somebody say amen. amen. Sometimes we don't understand who our owner is. 
But there is something written, just like that VIN number that is on the registration. That VIN number is on the motor. That VIN number is in the window. And when you look at that VIN number, you know that it has an identification that is to that owner that it should be operating in. Somebody needs to say amen right here. Because you need to understand that you have a VIN number on you according to the registration that is in heaven that you are owned by God. God is owner of you. And written on your heart is that vehicle identification number that lets people know that I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, if you don't know that this morning because you're confused, then I'm here to tell you, you need to stick around for a little bit because we have a little bit of something more to say to you. And I'm here to tell you that the documentation that tells us who we belong to is the Word of God. And as we look at that word of God, we know beyond a shadow of doubt who we belong to. And, and I can take that car and I can leave it as a wreck on the side of the road. Whose responsibility is it to come and take care of it? It's the owner's responsibility. And you may feel like that this morning, that you have been left on the side of the road like a wreck. But if you belong to Jesus Christ, he is the owner of you. It is his responsibility to come and take care of you according to the documentation that is in heaven. His word that has been given to us. We belong to him. Therefore, you may feel like a wreck. You may look like a wreck. And the person may, sitting next to you may look even more like a wreck than you. But you can say that we belong to Jesus Christ because the word says it. Hallelujah. And if I don't understand that, if I don't understand the ownership, there's a problem that is going to show up in my life. Because I'm going to walk according to how I feel about the word. I'm going to walk according to how I feel about what's written there. I need to understand ownership. Tell the person next to you, you need to understand ownership. You need to understand who you belong to. As we look at Philippians chapter 3 in verse number 20, it says, We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power which he will bring everything under his control. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. Yes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would open up our ears to receive your word this morning. Lord, we pray that as your word is anointed, we pray that our ears too will be anointed to hear. Lord, help us to change the direction and understand who we are owned by. Lord, your word tells us beyond a shadow of a doubt that once we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that we belong to him. And Lord, we just pray right now in Jesus' name, bring that word to a reality to those who do not understand it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There, there's a teaching that we uh, seldom see preached today. It's a teaching that I see in Scripture. And I'm afraid that there's been a lot of conversation around this country that have hijacked this teaching, and this word. I'm afraid that conversations around being a part of a woke culture, cult, I mean culture, has hijacked and prevented some from teaching on it. But I believe that this phrase or this idea helps us to disciple Christians in a way that brings them closer to God if we understand the word that I'm about to say in a few moments. And I think Paul understood his relationship with Jesus Christ. He understood what ownership was all about. And in understanding ownership, he was able to take this phrase and he was able to embrace it with dignity, with grace, and with love because he knew who he belonged to. Salvation may start with an experience, but salvation continues as a journey. 
I said salvation may start with an experience, a spiritual experience, but it continues with a spiritual journey. It was a miraculous experience that brought you to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But as I continue with that experience, there is all of a sudden I realize there is a journey that I'm on. And where I'm going in that journey, I am headed towards heaven. It reminds me of the story of Paul. Paul was on the road to Damascus. And Paul was one of those who were killing Christians, putting them in jail, doing all kinds of things because he thought he was doing the right thing. But all of a sudden, as Paul was on that Damascus road, all of a sudden he had an experience. He had a miraculous experience that caused him to come into relationship with Jesus Christ. And as a result of coming into that relationship with Jesus Christ, all of a sudden he found himself on a journey. He was off of the road to Damascus and on the road to heaven because he understood his citizenship. He understood that he was one with Christ. And in being one with Christ, he understood something had to change as far as his ownership was concerned. Someone can convince you that you're owned by somebody else or someone else. But I'm here to tell you, you're owned by Jesus if he is your Lord and Savior. And Paul helps us to understand in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 20. He says, we are citizens of heaven. Citizens of heaven, amen. And I tell you, I went and I wanted to look up that word citizen. And I said, what in the world? Because I knew there was something great behind it. I said, let me look up this word. It is an inhabitant of a city or town, especially one entitled to the rights and privileges of a free man. I said, I'm entitled to the rights and the privileges of a free man because I am a citizen of heaven. There is something that I have because of the word of God and understanding who I am owned by and understanding my ownership that there are certain rights that come to me. And it says, and further along in this definition, it says a member of a state, a native or naturalized person who owes allegiance to a government. I tell you, I owe allegiance to Jesus Christ this morning. As being a citizen of heaven, my allegiance is to him. It is the government of heaven that I am allegiance to. And I am entitled, and the rest of this word is said, entitled to the protection from it. As a result of being a citizen of heaven, I am entitled to what Jesus Christ has me for me, the protection that he gives to me. And I can think of this in terms of my past, my present, and my future because of the ownership that he has of me. Amen? And so therefore, we are citizens of heaven. I may be on this globe, but I know who I am a citizen of. I may be a citizen of the United States, but I know I'm also a citizen of heaven. No matter where I go on this globe, I am still a citizen of the United States. No matter where I go on this globe, I am still a citizen of heaven. Some may look at me and they may say, made in America. But when Jesus looks at me, he says, made in heaven. Amen. Because of the spirit of God that is in me and doing his thing in me. I know who I am belonging to. I know who my Lord and Savior is. There is no confusion about the ownership of me. Now, if you're here this morning and you're confused, I tell you, stick around just a little far longer because we have more word for you. And this is not my opinion. This is the word of God that I'm giving you this morning. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ, what? Where he lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. I am eagerly waiting for him to return. I am eagerly waiting for him to return. I am excited about his return. And that you, I, I tell you, if you know me, you know I'm excited about Jesus. That's just who I am because I know who I'm owned by. The vehicle number in my heart is Jesus Christ, a citizen of heaven. In verse 21, it says, he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power. I love this word. Using the what? The same power which he will bring everything under his control. 
The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The same power that when he was going through a crowd and the woman with an issue of blood who reached out and she touched him. She touched the hem of his garment. And he said, something came out of me. I felt virtue come out of me. The same power that as he was going and he went to Jairus' house and he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. That same power resides in me today. The same power resides in you. Whether you understand it or embrace it or not, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all of a sudden that power rose up in you. But if you don't understand it or don't know it, you can think you're just that wreck by the side of the road. But I'm here to tell somebody you need to understand your ownership. Yeah. Understand your ownership. We're living in a day and an age that the enemy is trying to take power away from the church. The enemy is trying to take power from the children of God. But if we don't understand our ownership and who we belong to, we will give it right over to him. Understand who you are as a citizen of heaven. And that same power resides in you today. Yes. Well, Pastor Carl, I don't feel like that power is in me. <laughs> well, Pastor Carl, my sister, my tia, my tio. <laughs> That's all the Spanish I know. <laughs> I don't care who told you what, but according to the word of God, that same power resides in you. If you don't tap into it, it's just there. It's just like if I have an iron and if I don't plug it in, it has the power. It has the ability to have the power, but if I don't plug it in, it won't have the power that I'm able to utilize it. And you may not be plugging into the power that is made available to you to utilize it in your life or in the lives of others that are around you. Somebody need to say amen. amen. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. There are individuals in this room and online who do not stay true to the Lord because they're so distracted by the things that are going on in the world. They're so distracted by the things that are going on in the government. They're so distracted by the things that people say online. But I tell you, don't be distracted by those things that are going on. Be constructed in your life. Be constructed in the Word of God. Let that build you up. Let that take you to the next place. Think past, present, and future. You may say to yourself, you know what, Pastor Carl, you don't know my past. I may not know your past, but I know your presence, and I know your future. Some of us, we're living as a result of the consequences of our past, the consequences of the choices that we have made. But let me tell you, the influence of the present and the future can be according to the word and the power of God if you tap into knowing who you are, knowing who you're owned by. Your ownership is Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 1. That word, I'm coming back to it now. Because I'm, I'm sure you're sitting there wondering like, what word, what phrase was he talking about? Paul says... This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. Slaves of Christ Jesus. We live in a culture today that if you use that word, they use it as a word that brings bondage to people. But when we use it as a word of Jesus Christ, for I know who I belong to. There's a teaching in the word that talks about bond servants, talks about bond slaves. And if you had an owner, you were a slave and you had an owner and that your freedom came because usually you had to serve for seven years. And then at the end of that, you were free. But if you so, so desired to stay with that master, he would take you to the doorpost and he would take an awl, which is like a long nail and would take your ear and put a hole in your ear. Now, some of you, you go to the place where they take a little needle and you squirm and do all those kinds of things just from a needle. But imagine like a six penny nail or 10 penny nail or however those big ones. Imagine someone putting that in your ear and making a hole. Because you so desire to want to stay with that master. And Paul, in understanding this word slave, he says, what? Slaves of Christ Jesus. 
I'm here to tell you this morning, I am a slave to Christ Jesus. And my question to you, whose slave are you? Whose slave are you? Because I understand the ownership and I understand the proper use of the word. And I don't let what has happened in Western culture snatch that word away from me because I am a slave of Jesus Christ. So no matter what they're saying in the culture, I understand whose slave I am. And it's not a slave of man, but a slave of Christ Jesus. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leader and deacons. And I ask you this morning, do we have any holy people in the house today? Do we have any people that belong to Jesus today? Do we have people who understand the owner's manual today? Do we have people who are reading it and understanding it? Because I have people that I sometimes see as I'm talking and ministering. Well, I don't understand the Bible. I've read it, but I don't understand it. You know what my answer to them is? It's an owner's manual. That's why you don't understand it. You're not owned by him. Therefore, he has not revealed to you the mysteries that are in his word. But we, the people of God, when he puts that deposit, that Holy Spirit in us, all of a sudden we're able to disciple the word of God. All of a sudden the mysteries of the word become, begin to come from the pages that gets down into our heart, down into our life, that we're able to share with others. And people can sometimes say to us, I've read that over and over, but I never understood it until you explained it to me. But there's something about the people of God. When we read the word of God, we understand the word of God. We're able to put the word of God out as a result of who we are owned by. The world does not understand that. Paul understand that he was bought. He was bought by the blood of Jesus. You were bought by the blood of Jesus. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 it tells us, for everyone has sinned. Everyone, all of us. You may think you're good in this place, but guess what? The word of God says all of us have sinned. And as a result of all of us sinning, we all fall short of the glorious Standard. Well, what was that standard? The standard was the law. That was the standard that God had given to the people. And each and every one of them could not measure up to it. They all fell. And even today, we all fall short of that standard that God has given. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet God, yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. We can't measure up to the law, but there's something that God has done that gives us the opportunity that when God looks down at us who are not able to fulfill the law, when he looks down at us, he sees Jesus Christ. That ought to shake somebody up. <clears throat> Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Every one of us should be dead and gone to hell. But as a result of the grace of Jesus Christ going on that cross, that the Father has shown us grace, shown us love. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned. Everyone in this room should have been punished for that sin that we have done. But because of the love of God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have available to us forgiveness. And that forgiveness is that this sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in present time. Your past, your present, and your future as locked up in the sacrifice that Jesus went before. God did not demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. He makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see made in the USA, made in Italy, Mexico, or wherever you think you were made, but he sees 
made in heaven by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The blood of Jesus has purchased your healing. Like I said, you may feel like that wreck that has been left by the side of the road, but the owner has come to pick you up, take you to his bosom, love you, heal you. How do I know? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin. Sin no longer have to control you, but we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. By his wounds, you are healed. Present tense. Well, Pastor Carl, I don't feel like I'm healed. The word says what? You are healed. Well, I'm just waiting for the reality of it to catch up with me. I'm waiting for the word of God to tell this body to get straight. I'm waiting for the power of God to raise up within me. Do you know, there are times when God does a miracle and he does it instantly. There have been times that I've been sick and I have prayed out to God and instantly something happened to where I was healed by him. And then there have been other times that it has taken a few days for God to heal me. There have been other times it has taken longer than that. And God is still in the process of healing others. Paul says, I prayed out to the Lord three times. And the Lord said what? My grace is sufficient. Paul didn't stop praying, but he trusted God. And if you're sick and in need of healing this morning, the word says you are already healed. Trust God for your healing. Trust God for the evidence of that healing because you're already healed. Well, I don't feel like, are you going to trust your word or your feelings? your word that has been given to you by God, or your feelings. Because it says, we have been healed. Verse 25, it says, Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned turned to the shepherd, the guardian of your soul. Learning and understanding who you're owned by is the beginning of life. Paul understood that he was bought. Paul understood he was rescued. He was rescued from the influences of his past into his present life. The presents bring you God's power. You don't have to be influenced by the, pres- by the past, but you're going to allow the power of God to take you into your future as letting him be who he wants to be in your life. It's all about the consequences of the past, but what is your present bringing you? You know, Satan has a desired outcome for each and every one of us. And that outcome is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But sometimes some of us, we're convinced that it's all about us. Well, Satan is trying to destroy me. No, he's not. He's trying to destroy the generations after you. You're just collateral damage but he's after what comes after you. He's after your family. He's after your heritage. He's in the process of building an army and he's taking advantage of every person who is distracted. He's in the process of building an army that will seduce the powers of this world. But we, the children of God, the elect of God, have to be awake and see what's going on in the world and speak out against it. Well, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. We were put here to ruffle feathers. We were put here to ruffle feathers. If they hated Jesus, what makes you think they will not hate you? If they crucified Jesus, what makes you think they won't crucify you? 
But the same power that raised him up from the dead is the same power that will raise you up from the dead. It's the same power that will raise you up from ridicule. The same power that will raise you up from people talking about you, people despitefully using you. That same power is residing in you for a reason and not just to make you look spiritually good, but to make you know that you are owned by an awesome and powerful God that will change the courses of some people's life if you just talk to them, if you just witness to them about who owns you. There are so many Christians that people think they're owned by somebody else or somebody in the world. I tell you this morning, I am not owned by this world. I am owned by an awesome and powerful God. And he has established in me his power. He has put within me a deposit of what is yet still to come. Even, in fact, there is even more power that is yet to come. I think you guys are sleeping. <laughs> Understand the scriptures. Understand his word that has been written to you. Because before the foundations of the world, before the foundations of this globe, do you know Christ died for us? Before the foundations of this globe, do you know we were chosen to be his family? We were chosen as a people to put his power into? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3, it says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. You have spiritual blessings that have been afforded to you. And it says, in heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ, we have this power because we're united to him. Not to just sit on the power, but to use the power in our own lives, but also in the lives of others. It says, even before he made the world, God's love, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and gave him great pleasure. In other words, what happened was God, before the foundations of the world, God had already known that Jesus Christ was going to have to come here to this earth to die for us. That process was already in the mind and the heart of God that it would happen. But it's up to each and every one of us to embrace that process, to embrace that promise. There are people that are walking around the globe who know nothing about the availability of God's love to them, God's grace to them. If I don't act on it, then it's of no avail to me. If I don't act on it, then it's just like something that is sitting by the side of the road, like that power I was talking about that is there for me. It's just like if I buy you a birthday gift and you don't receive it, it's just sitting there. And I want to thank those of you last week, Wednesday, surprising me with happy birthday. Almost took my life. (laughs) That was wonderful. And now I have a year for all 66 books of the Bible. You mean you're that old? I'm that young. (laughs) the joy of the Lord is my strength the joy of the Lord is my youth also (laughs) as a result of the power of God who is in you God will enable you to do whatever he has called you to do and many times many of us don't understand our calling because we don't understand our ownership many of us don't talk about God because we don't understand our ownership Understand your ownership this morning. Understand what God is trying to accomplish through you. Paul understood he was rescued. Rescued from himself and rescued from this world. Paul was running around, and I said earlier, causing people to die as a result of the name of Jesus until all of a sudden he stepped in to the life himself. When we look at the cross, the cross was about death through humiliation. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he looked upon himself, the curse for our wrongdoing. In other words, we should have been going to that cross. But Christ was the one who was put on the cross. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is anyone who is hung on a cross, on a tree, 
Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promise by the Holy Spirit through faith. As we put faith in Jesus Christ, we can embrace that promise. The part of the problem that was going on and we see that led up to this crucifixion, as we look at the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they thought that automatically, because they were Abraham's children, automatically they had a ticket to heaven. But when Christ came on the scene, he showed them that the law was pointing to the crucifixion, the death of Jesus Christ, and as being a point towards it, meaning that now we have to embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That was the, what God has provided for our salvation, no longer the law. The law does not give them an automatic ticket or being a part of Abraham's family does not give them an automatic ticket. And that's what they were thinking. But we know through the word of God that as we embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that's what gets us to heaven. That's what makes us a citizen of heaven. And verse number 14, it says, Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to, the, to Abraham. We have that promise. But if we don't understand it, or acknowledge it, or embrace it, it's just like something on a shelf. Paul understood he was delivered. He was delivered from his past into a new future. He was delivered by Jesus to the Father as a child of God. This morning you have been delivered to the Father as a part of his family. Romans chapter 10, verse number 1. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. He said, I wish they would be saved. But I know what enthusiasm they have for God because he had that same enthusiasm. And what did he call it? But his misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. And refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. I've run into people before who say, well, I have my own way of serving God. I have my own way of being a Christian. And I ask them, does it line up with the word of God? Oh, no, I, just, I, I, I know how I need to live. Well, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's just your own understanding. And as the word says here, that their own understanding is not God's way. That is just their own zeal, their own enthusiasm in which they're living by. And according to that enthusiasm, they're on their way where? On their way to hell unless they understand who Jesus Christ is and embrace him. Because he is the sacrifice that God provided for our eternal life. And some refuse to accept God's way. They cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. That's how you get right with God. That's how you change your citizenship. That's how you become a slave of Christ. We never have to worry about our tomorrows as being a citizen of God. We never have to worry about it. And as we continue to walk upon this globe, we have a promise, a promise from heaven as to who we are. You may be sitting here this morning and you may say, I never understood this ownership thing. I never understood that through the word of God, there's a VIN number that says I belong to Jesus. I never took the time to start reading his word to get more from him. But today that changes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there are those that walked into this room, tuned in online, and they've been distracted. Distracted by a falsehood that they can be right with you, Father without being right with Jesus. But you're pointing out to them today that they can change their ownership. They can change their ownership. Some were owned by themselves, 
and some were owned by the enemy. But as they look at their lives today, they see that they're a wreck by the side of the road. The enemy has abandoned them. Family members have abandoned them. But those who are owned by you, you will come and claim. Lord, I pray that as they sit here this morning, that they will change owners. They walk into this building not knowing you as Lord and Savior, but they will walk out under new ownership. Lord, as your spirit is working in their hearts right now, we know that that is conviction that you bring. Lord, your heart was broken way before their heart was broken because you saw the destruction that was going on in their lives. And Lord, we just pray that you touch them right now that the miraculous will happen in their lives right now. Lord, you're revealing to them your desire for them. And we just pray they will accept. With all eyes closed and all heads bowed, if you're in this auditorium or online, right there where you are, you would say, Pastor Carl, I need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Would you signify that by just raising your hand right there where you are, at home or in this building? Right there where you are. Thank you. Just keep it there for a moment. Others, just raise your hand. Thank you. Others, thank you. Thank you. Others, others. To my right, others. At home. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, you see these hands that are raised right now. They're signifying with a raised hand that they need you. They're ready to change ownership. That's a miracle, Lord. A miracle that you have brought to them. And we thank you. You may put your hands down. I want everyone at home and in the auditorium to say this prayer along with me. And those of you who raised your hand, as you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, a change will take place as a result of the Spirit of God coming into you and changing ownerships. Let us all pray with them. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for bringing me here today to hear this word. And Lord, I pray that you will touch me miraculously. I pray as I confess my sins before you. And the word says, if I confess my sins, you will, you will forgive me. I ask Jesus into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. And I know that the word is true, that he has done that. And from this day forward, I will not be the same. I am saved. I am forgiven. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for those that were here today and those that heard this word and those who will hear this word later. I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to convince them of the ownership that they are owned by you, oh God, by free will. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to direct them in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God keep you.